Welcome to the Mental Insights Podcast. This is a community aimed at understanding all sides of mental health, addiction, and homelessness. Each interview will include either a personal story or an expert's advice within one of these fields. The goal of this project is to promote awareness, guidance, and support for anyone who is affected by these challenges. Thank you all for listening. Welcome back to part two of season two, episode three with Elena Davidson. We are going to be talking about social and emotional cues within this part of the episode. Last episode, if you listened, we spoke about navigating relationships. So check that out if you haven't already. To really start off and and speaking about social and emotional cues, to really just put into perspective, how can someone really learn about their life through their emotions and through their feelings? How can this play a role in in that self-identification and that reflection? Yeah, I think there's a cultural message for a lot of us that our feelings, especially feelings that are, quote, negative, are wrong or bad or mean there's something wrong with us or that we should just get over them. Like, why am I feeling grouchy? Or even like, you know, you're not, it's not appropriate to be angry, things like that. So most of us have learned how to like essentially dismiss feelings and dismiss what's going on with us, that stiff upper lip, whatever. There's a whole bunch of expressions that we, we use in our um, in our language that sort of distance ourselves from our emotion. Being super emotional is considered a negative thing. And what I've come to see is, is that actually real, um, emotions are really a super important uh, information system, or I think of it as like an emotional navigation system that is giving us at any given moment important cues and important information about ourselves and our lives. And the more that we start to listen and pay attention to what our feelings are telling us about our experiences, the better we can use them to navigate our whole lives. It's like, um, I don't know if you've heard people say this, but I've definitely throughout my life, and I used to be one of the people that's, that would say this, like, why am I feeling this way? I shouldn't feel what I'm feeling. Now, is that actually true? And can you even affect that? You're feeling what you're feeling because you're feeling it. Someone once told me that, um, and it was eye-opening for me, that your feelings are not up for negotiation. And I just love that because I was arguing with myself all the time about how I felt and how I shouldn't feel the way I felt. He said, your feelings are not up for negotiation. They are the lived experience of the moment that you're in. So if somebody says something to you and it is, you have feeling of upset or anger or sadness or whatever is showing up, that's just what's showing up in that moment. That is how whatever that person said impacted you in that moment. Now you can look at it and understand where the feeling is coming from or what it's about. But it is just what's happening. And the more that I started to listen to my feelings, the more that I could see how the world is impacting me and then make different choices around it. You know, as you were saying that, there's there's so much to connect within what we did previously in the other episode of how at early ages that's kind of brought to the point. And a lot of our emotional responses can correlate, can be similar you spoke about coping mechanisms as well that gravitate throughout our life. And, you know, within the topic of learning, identifying your emotions, having this emotional intelligence, trying to become more self-aware, certainly there's people that learn it at younger ages, but for many, it's later in life when they actually learn how to start identifying their own emotions, start to learn what even the meaning is behind these. So, for just people out there at what age should people start trying to focus on social and emotional awareness and kind of how can this be taught in a proper manner besides just being within yourself how how can we try to integrate this within our communities well so what i would say that all of us are born connected to our feelings 
connected to our emotional navigation system. Have you ever met a baby that didn't, that argued about their feelings or had any question about how they feel? No, they're hungry, they're crying, they're trying to get their needs met. Same with little kids. Most little kids that I know are incredibly expressive and incredibly in touch with how they feel, what they want, what they don't want. They're connected to their essential nature, which in part is being connected to what lives in you, your emotional experience, how life affects you, moves through you, and how you're influenced by the world around you. But on top of that, most of us are trained out of it, right? Most of us learn that we're not supposed to feel how we feel, you know, man up, you know, don't cry, it's no big deal, you're not hurt. And, and so part of the transition sort of at a cultural level is to start supporting our already existing innate emotional intelligence that we came into this world with and to be with children in a way that validates their feelings, helps them stay connected to that truth because kids know so well who they are. I would say to some degree, know so clearly and so well who they are, what they like, what they don't like, what they want, what they don't want, and often will go to great lengths to get what they want from life. And so really the work then becomes reconnection to what already existed in you from the very beginning. Reconnection with what your feelings are telling you, what is really going on for you. And for some people, the disconnection has been in some way so extreme and almost so total that's like, I don't, feeling, what's that? Either you've learned to like cut yourself off and just function sort of, they call it above the neck, which is a nice way of saying like you're emotionally unavailable and, and to rationalize and think things out. And body cues are one way, notice what's going on in your body. So just to begin to notice or just to ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? Do I, do I have any awareness? Oh, my, my, my hands are clenched in fists. My jaw is tight. Or I feel this pain in my chest. Like, what is that? Oh, oh, maybe I'm feeling some grief. Wow, okay. And so to just start to give yourself to permission to even associate with your feelings. They've sort of been dismissed, relegated. I don't, I haven't had that problem in my life. I've always been an incredibly feeling person, although I did feel very wrong about having so many feelings. Pay attention to what those things are that you, you kind of got wanted to see or hear or blocked out. Yeah. It, no, it's, it's really beautifully said because you, you're put it into a perfect perspective of, you know, what I think happens throughout many people is, you know, you're speaking about when someone's a baby, when somebody's a child and so in tune with these emotions, with these connections. And then if you see within our society, you know, throughout, I mean, especially when you're really getting over that phase, when you start have your own responsibilities, your own opportunities to do this, when you look within 18 to 25 year olds, that's where some of the largest mental health challenges are happening. This is where people are saying, you know, do we do we go with our emotions what what's going on is is this right is this wrong should i feel this way and they don't have any type of resource or kind mm -hmm. of there's no there's no prior assumption of what what should be done how they should act you know we're in a new time and a new way of if you look back i mean 50 100 years ago everybody would kind of deal with it and they were in a smaller communities so more could be said one-on-one, -on -one, but now we're in a phase where technologically we can reach out to anybody or we could be isolated by ourselves. How are we going to navigate these emotions correctly and interact with people in the right way, in the same way? And, you know, what did our past really affect us in this manner? Yeah, well, I'm just like, I'm so intrigued and it's so interesting that you bring up sort of being like an 18 to 20 something year old because one of my sort of 
theory's understandings is that when you're a little kid and your parents are not emotionally available or emotionally responsive, you learn to adapt and you learn to adapt your feelings and or even even if there's like more severe sort of neglect or abuse or things like that up into a certain age it's not ex it's safe to express those kinds of feelings towards your parents because again you're dependent on them for your survival so you need to maintain your connection your relationship and your bond and so to ex if they're not going to be able to hold the space to have empathy for your upset your experience like something happens and you're angry but your parents dis disconnect from you and sort of shun you you're going to learn very quickly that that's life threatening because you need that relationship um, but what i'm the how that relates to the 18 to 20 something year old is that what i've noticed is i think that a lot of the stuff that kids were not allowed to experience or to feel and this was true for me as a little kid it showed up more in in high school my emotional stuff but it was like all of the suppressed stuff that I didn't have access to as a little kid because I needed my relationship with my parents so much, then became, well, for me in high school, it became internalized and it became severe depression. And I think that if I had been able to identify how angry I was at my parents and how upset I was about not getting my needs met in childhood, I may have transitioned much more quickly out of severe depression and dealing with depression. And it was really only, and it took me probably another decade or even more to really recognize how much of my depression and uh, mental health issues had to do with like those suppressed emotions that I hadn't ever been allowed to feel. And when I finally started to claim my truth and to understand that I was not happy about certain things and like allow myself to express. So depression is like, you know, pushing down or sometimes I think about like the pressure cooker, right? You're pressing in all the stuff that wants to come out. And if you don't let it come out, then it gets really heavy. And I think that's a lot of like why you're mentioning what you did is like that 18 to 25 year old you're moving away from your parents, you're having different influences, you're getting to a different place in your life. And you're also like, some of those impacts of your childhood are now coming to the surface a little bit more. And can you let them come out? Can you see them for what they are? Can you help to heal those places? Or you, have you been so cut off? And has there been such, you know, in some cases, it's like when the, the world around you denies that anything ever was wrong or anything happened, then it's um, a survival mechanism to internalize it and to think the problem is with you. But if you can start to tease that apart and start to recognize what your feelings are telling you, it's like, I realized at some point, like, I don't have all this, I'm not just a, F fuck up, excuse my language, but that's a used to, I used to think about myself like that. Like mm -hmm. I have been going through all of the things that I've been going through for so long and just be because I have mental health issues. There's got to be something that impacted me and affected me. And the more I started to own that, like, yeah, there were some things that nobody wanted to talk about or acknowledge about my experiences growing up that had a severe impact on me. And that's what brought me to being quote dysfunctional in the way that I am it really it, then it like almost normalized it was like I loved your interview with um now I'm gonna forget his last name but Eric the doctor that really talks about psychological injury because he really uh, highlights that almost all mental health issues has to do with being hurt in some way psychologically mm -hmm you switch it around and stop going like what's wrong with me I'm a screwed up person and start looking at what happened to me and what harm did I experience what impacts on my life are creating now the symptoms that I have and then it's like well instead of I'm a messed up broken person I'm a hurt person that has sustained a lot of hurt and how can I heal 
the hurt that took place from all of these different contributing factors. And that really just shifts it so much for me um, to be in that space of people, babies aren't born depressed. Let's just say that. Babies aren't born depressed. They get that way for a reason. And all of us get that way for a reason. And if we can really understand, and I believe this wholeheartedly, when you can really get to the root of the harm, the pain, the, the injury, so to speak, that ha has happened to you, and you can start to heal it there, you can shift your experience. And I say this from experience of feeling suicidal, feeling incredibly depressed, um, not wanting to live, all these kinds of things. And once I got to like, the core issue, the core pain, the core belief, whatever that was at the root, and was able to identify it and work with it. Then, like sometimes, sometimes like a foot, uh, a switch, like I go from feeling depressed to feeling like, oh, I'm not depressed anymore. And it can, you know, when you get to the truth, it can be that easy just to shift your experience. Mm -hmm. Spot on. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you spoke a lot about that in terms of the internalizing of of oneself and having to look within yourself to make that step often people are able to identify that they are feeling these ways but they don't necessarily know how to take it that next step even for some people experiencing some of these emotions whether it's depression whether it's anxiety whether it's um, suicidality they unless it's something severe like suicidality someone may not know if they are actually having troubles within some type of trauma or some type of past experience they may just think oh maybe this is just what i'm experiencing at this moment or at this month this week and so forth for someone to really come to terms to 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 wake up to identify that it could have been something in their past what are some type of cues what are some types of ways that they can take to identify or allow themselves to, to change that perspective to, to see if there is something more rooted than mm -hmm. what their present moment is. I think the first thing that comes to mind is the difference between like what we would call circumstantial depression and then uh, clinical depression, which like I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I, I'm using those terms very loosely, but I know for me, often the difference is circumstantial depression is there's this event happening in my life that is hard and challenging. And I kind of know why I'm depressed. Like my, somebody just died, let's say that in that is contributing to depression or I'm having a conflict at work and it's really bringing me down. And, and so the more that you point can point to these um, and even that's not, honestly, that's not the necessarily a foolproof indicator because sometimes you can have a conflict with somebody that actually goes back to and reminds you of a conflict from your childhood. Uh, one telltale sign is if you've dealt with feelings of depression or, or mental health challenges throughout your life, then there's a good chance that there's some sort of injury. We're going to talk about psychological injury. There's some sort of hurt or harm or um, upset that happened to you that hasn't been taken care of adequately and hasn't really been addressed adequately. Now I know that certain people will say that um, it's a chemical imbalance in your brain. Uh, I happen to, I say if medications work for you, then do what works for you. However, there's a lot of research and a lot of evidence and not that that's not necessarily true. And then there's not really much evidence that proves that that is true. Um, again, I want to support people to find what works for them. In our modern medicine way of thinking, the focus I've noticed is almost entirely on, on treating symptoms and not addressing cause, not addressing what's really going on in a person's life, not really understanding the root of it and, and the pain of it. Um, and so that's really something I'm actually, I'm doing a, actually a little survey questionnaire right now for my potential clients for if really anybody who thinks maybe they've had an ongoing issue with mental health. And, and so 
listeners are welcome to take that. It's you just go to healingmindsandhearts.com backslash survey. You can fill out the survey and just notice if, if there's a whole bunch of those pieces that um, that you check, there's several sections where there's check boxes. If you're checking a whole bunch of those, there's a good chance that there's something from your past that needs to be addressed and, and taken care of. And and get with somebody that can help. If you're just like, I don't even know what's going on. I just don't feel right. Or I'm feeling depressed or I should be happier than I am. And I don't understand why, because that's definitely a lot of what I see and how I used to feel in my life. Like, why am I not happy? I've done all this work for myself. I don't understand what I'm missing. Um, then go find somebody like me, or, you know, there are many qualified people out there that can help you sort through and understand and what's going on. And I would also say part of the journey of to mental health and to happiness is finding the right people to help you. And I know we talked about this a little bit before, but going to the wrong people for help, whether it's your peers or sometimes even professionals can just kind of take you down a deeper place of depression, of despair, nobody's able to help me. Um, I know like I went to therapy a few different times and didn't find it helpful, although now I have a lovely therapist. Um, and so it's a, it's a tricky navigational place, but I would say start by reaching out to people like me and Brendan, people who have maybe dealt with their own mental health and their own struggles and then have made a shift or a change and start having little conversations and, and maybe you can be pointed in a direction that's going to be useful and helpful for you to start understanding and also read my book finding your own happy because in there i talk a lot about especially for people who feel like i've struggled my whole life and i don't really understand why i don't get what's going on for me a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about with the childhood stuff and, and relationship stuff, that's all in there. And paying attention to your feelings is all in there. Um, and so that might give you also some good insight as to like, hey, what's really going on here that maybe I've been missing this whole time and, and start to give you some relief. And you can get a copy of my book actually at findingyourownhappybook.com or just go to my website. Uh, healing minds and hearts and you can get it there wonderful and we'll have all those links below in the show notes so anybody listening can just click below on the notes and make sure you can go to elena's website check out her book and take the survey as well what, with what you were talking about i think it does bring into the conversation of setting boundaries and especially within social settings so, you know, for someone who does have certain mental health challenges, maybe has to protect themselves through certain emotional uh, advances, emotional experiences, how can someone set these, these kind of boundaries in their social settings in order to protect themselves from maybe feeling some of these emotions that will bring them into a place of negativity or darkness? If you're a sensitive person, um, which is a lot of, you've heard me mention it before, but a lot of my um, experience was, I was highly sensitive to the people around me, the feelings around me, easily affected, and even still am if I don't pay attention to it with what's going on with other people. And the book actually has a lot of really great tools for figuring out what's you and your feelings and your experience and what's other people. Because if you're really sensitive, if you're an empath, if you're a highly sensitive person, or even like, even maybe you don't identify with that, those terms, but maybe you're just feel like you're a little bit more sensitive than other people, there's a good chance that a lot of the emotional content and even to some degree your depression has to do with feeling everything that's going on with, around you and not being able to tell the difference. And a good, another good indicator also is like, if you're with people and you feel a certain way and you leave and you feel different, it's a good chance what you're feeling had to do with those people and not with you. And so, and again, getting in touch with what's true for yourself and being connected to your own self is gonna help a lot to, to sort that out. And, um, 
at first for me, it was just all a big mess and I didn't know the difference between any of it. I just felt like I'm screwed up and I have emotional issues and I'm depressed and I don't know what, which way is up kind of thing. So, um, so the beginning is to start to unravel a little bit of that and start to understand that if you think you might be a, a super sensitive person or you might be feeling a whole bunch of stuff that maybe isn't yours, which for some people that's going to sound kind of weird, but I mean, my friend, she was telling me about, she's was telling me about her boyfriend and, and some problems she was having. And I felt her pain and I start, you know, I start crying because I'm feeling so much of what's going on with her. And I have a tool that I offer in my book and that I teach my clients was to ask yourself, like, wait a minute, what am I aware of here? Is this actually mine? Literally, I've been crying tears and asked myself that question and had them go away or like, there's this heaviness that I just feel. I was like, huh, I wasn't feeling heavy like an hour ago. Like what, where's this coming from? Also, if you have a sudden mood shift, like could it be that all of a sudden you're like picking up on somebody else's energy? And um, so just start to pay attention and to notice, I think is so big. Like notice what you're feeling, what it's related to. And and the external factors that influence those feelings, like, oh yeah, every time I get around this person, I feel this certain way. And when I'm not around them, I don't feel that way. Hmm, that's a good sign that it's connected in some way to that person. And then another piece that I didn't mention in the beginning, but that your feelings, so your feelings as your emotional navigation system in something called nonviolent communication, which I spent a lot of years studying. One of the core principles is that your feelings show up as indicators of your needs. So when you're hungry, it is indicating a need for like nourishment or food, right? When you're thirsty, you have a need for hydration. We don't really argue with those needs, right? It's like, I don't go like, why am I feeling hungry? I shouldn't be feeling hungry. I mean, maybe if you just ate, you might go like that. But most of us just acknowledge, oh, I'm feeling hungry. I need to feed myself. What if the rest of your feelings and emotions are also connected in some way to a need that you have? And so I'm feeling sad because, you know, I have a need for connection or I have a need for this other thing, or I'm feeling joy because I have, you know, fulfilled my need for something positive, whatever that is. And so when you can start to connect, and there's actually an exercise in the book where I, I go through some steps of how to identify what you're feeling and then look at what need might this feeling be pointing to? Or even like when you have discomfort or dissatisfaction or um, you know something's not quite right, like what is this telling me? Like there's one time, it, and I write about this also in the book where I realized Instead of arguing with my feelings, like, I, what, what's going on here? What is this telling me? Oh, it's telling me I am having discomfort about where I'm living and I'm not happy here and it's not working for me. I was like, oh, okay. And as soon as I acknowledge that to myself, instead of saying, why am I, you know, depressed, I get, I got so much happier and everything shifted because I had not acknowledged what message was trying to get through to me which is like you're not you need to move this is not working for you oh okay cool now i can just move and be happy again <laughs> so yeah it's it's so true and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and for some people obviously making these identifications and trying to become aware of these is is very challenging that's why the use of a therapist, the use of many of these professionals to help you see that perspective is always so great. As well, mm -hmm. there's tons of information online in order for us to, to take that next step, to start learning, to start educating ourselves about how we can identify our own emotions, our own interactions with others, how to set those boundaries. I want you to take this time to speak a little bit about your Facebook community and what my audience could gain value from being a part of that community. Sure. So I have a Facebook group called Finding Your Unhappy, also after the title of my book. And it's a, every day I'm posting different questions, different tips, different tools to help you engage with 
this process of being connected to yourself, being connected to your mental health. And um, it's actually, there's a lot of great activity in there now, different people sharing their experiences, sharing their stories. So you get to connect with other people who are working with mental health challenges perhaps, or just trying to improve the quality of their lives. So it is addressing things like depression, but it's also really focused on the positive almost, not ignoring that we have these struggles and we have these pains, but really looking at like what is going to help shift it. I know I've been in some other um, like overcoming depression groups or so forth and so on. And I think the thing that really sets the group that I'm running apart is first of all, it's a, it's a lot of actionable stuff that you can do or you can implement in your life. Um, there's a lot of questions there where you can engage and self-reflect and think about what it is for you. And then also there is that community of people sharing their experiences and their stories. And um, I'm having a lot of fun with it. And it seems like the people that are coming are having a lot of fun with it too and getting a lot of value out of it. So if you're interested, definitely invite you to come check it out and, and see if it's a, the right place for you to, to continue um, moving toward a happier place in your life. Maybe if you are still struggling with mental health or feeling like you're not as happy as you want to be or even depression is part of your life then you know I'd love to see you there and love to see what kind of um insights changes shifts that we can make to to bring you to a happier better feeling more content feeling place in your life we'll make sure to have the Facebook community linked as well in the show notes so you all can get accustomed and join the community that Elena has started and as well, all the resources that she has provided and continues to provide within her work. To really wrap up both of these episodes, this time together that we've been able to share and speak about navigating relationships, as well as social and emotional cues, and even to wrap in with our episode back in season one, episode 18 of the Mental Insights podcast, I want to ask you if you were given a unlimited amount of money in order to do your work, in order to make an impact within the mental health community, what would be some ideas, some different ways you'd want to invest money in order to help cure, in order to help change and inform people about mental health and steps that they could do in order to recover from a trauma that they've experienced or um, any type of experience that has caused any type of mental, emotional, or physical withdrawal, any type of trauma or or negative emotion that they have felt throughout this, what, what would you really allocate your funds towards? What would you like to do within the mental health community if you had unlimited funds today? Wow, what a question. The first thing that comes to mind is to go back to the root and back to the source and the thing that brought us to the places of, of the pains that we have. And that's to look at how children are being raised and to invest in, in things that help create a more supportive culture for kids, more, more emotionally intelligent and developmentally appropriate environment for kids to grow up in and and really and I can't think of the specifics right now but using resources to affect cultural change at the level of early childhood particularly and you know probably in the education system somewhat as well because that's so much where we get disconnected from ourselves and broken from ourselves and then sort of going up into the like okay now we didn't prevent the problem but now we're trying to deal with the problem space one of the things that I think is important is understanding that mental health is not just an individual problem, it's also a collective problem, which we talked about a little bit before in last uh, season's episode, but that we need to start reweaving culture and finding ways to reweave cultures of support and care and that recognize that the epidemic of mental health crises that we're having right now is a symptom of the culture and the society that we live in, not just the failings of individual people, but that we live in a world that often doesn't address human need, 
often doesn't attend to emotional well-being. And so I would be looking at where are the places that I could leverage my resources to support emotional well-being and happiness. And actually, it's interesting to note there are a few countries now in the world that are, I think New Zealand being notably one, is putting human happiness and well-being above um, economic growth and economic, economic profit. Now, I'm not saying that they can't go hand in hand, but when we do one at the expense of the other, it doesn't really work. And so I would be really looking at how do we, how do we support that? How do we support creating cultures that really help people thrive and not go against so much of what we all need, which, you know, connection is one of them and meaningful purpose and work is another. So that's a short answer to how I would influence mental health. Awesome. I, I thank you for sharing that. And I think that's definitely one step in the right direction that we can take within this community. Um, I, I thank you for sharing not only that, but all the insights that you have throughout these past two parts of the third episode of season two of the Mental Insights podcast. I, I want to thank you for taking this time with me, Elena, and we'll have all your information below for everybody to connect with you, to build your audience bigger, because what we want to do, as we've stated before, and we have continued chatted throughout, is you know to build this community, to build a, a better light within mental health, and, and try to try to make change, try to create waves within, within our communities, within our society in order to, to share and, and make a better light within our society, within our own self, so we can help others as well. So everybody can be selfish in order to be selfless. And, and that's what we're able to do now is to, to start helping people, to start supporting each other. And I'm so glad that you took this time to not only support my podcast, but to support all the listeners uh, today and and beyond to uh, learn more about navigating relationships, social emotional cues, as well our first episode on last season, um, episode 18, if anybody wants to check out. So thank you for being here with us, Elena. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. It's such valuable conversation and work. So thanks for also for doing what you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you all for tuning in for episode three of season two of the Mental Insights podcast. Thank you all for listening to this episode. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and review to this podcast. Let us know what you learned from this episode and what you would like to hear in the next episode. This has been your host, Brennan Catulli of the Mental Insights podcast. Have a wonderful day.